The World Health Organization estimates that 400 million people throughout the world lack access to basic health care. That is an incredible amount of individuals. Basic sanitation and clean water, prenatal care, and vaccines or immunizations for children are just a few of the services available. This crisis is caused by a variety of factors. When an emergency happens, some people live too far away to receive quick care. Even in cities, the patient-to-doctor ratio might be as high as 50,000 patients to one doctor, making it hard for that doctor to address the health care needs of that community. These are wonderful individuals who are physically suffering because they were created in the image of God. Many of them have never had a personal relationship with Jesus. So we provide a week of hands-on training that covers a wide range of topics such as basic sanitation and cleanliness, vital sign taking, wound care and infection prevention, basic birth helping, and emergency skills. Those who complete the course have practical skills in supplies that they can use to care for people in their community in a way that honors God and offers up new opportunities to share the gospel. The World Health Organization estimates that 400 million people throughout the world lack access to basic health care. That is an incredible amount of individuals. Basic sanitation and clean water, prenatal care, and vaccines or immunizations for children are just a few of the services available. This crisis is caused by a variety of factors. When an emergency happens, some people live too far away to receive quick care. Even in cities, the patient-to-doctor ratio might be as high as 50,000 patients to one doctor making it hard for that doctor to address the health care needs of that community. These are wonderful individuals who are physically suffering because they were created in the image of God. Many of them have never had a personal relationship with Jesus. So we provide a week of hands-on training that covers a wide range of topics such as basic sanitation and cleanliness, vital sign taking, wound care and infection prevention, basic birth helping, and emergency skills. Those who complete the course have practical skills in supplies that they can use to care for people in their community in a way that honors God and offers up new opportunities to share the gospel. You may invest up to $450 million in the stadium if you want to remain with the sports example. There will be a lot more vacant seats in their foyers if the players' abilities aren't good enough over a 10-year span, right? The talent is the brand, regardless of how well the marketing is done or how gorgeous the stadium looks. Again, Benny's and Biederman, the leaders of great groups, value and have a knack for discovering new talent. They take great pleasure in praising the abilities of others. Nowhere else in the world, save in a corporation or government, do we encourage the greatest accoutrement? Is there a finance department? Do they have a sales section for the greatest salesman? Where can I find the world's top trainer? We all do that in sports, don't we? Most of our coaches at the professional level are considered second or third tier players who excelled in their studies of the game and the individuals they coached. When I was a child, Yale University's swimming team would win the NCAA championships year after year. In addition, I had no idea that the scene had been confirmed, yet it comes as no surprise to me at all. While their coach couldn't really swim, he was a great motivator for his swimmers. Isn't that what it's all about? I think it has to do with the concept of leadership.
You may invest up to $450 million in the stadium if you want to remain with the sports example. There will be a lot more vacant seats in their foyers if the players' abilities aren't good enough over a 10-year span, right? The talent is the brand, regardless of how well the marketing is done or how gorgeous the stadium looks. Again, Benny's and Biederman, the leaders of great groups, value and have a knack for discovering new talent. They take great pleasure in praising the abilities of others. Nowhere else in the world, save in a corporation or government, do we encourage the greatest accoutrement? Is there a finance department? Do they have a sales section for the greatest salesman? Where can I find the world's top trainer? We all do that in sports, don't we? Most of our coaches at the professional level are considered second or third tier players who excelled in their studies of the game and the individuals they coached. When I was a child, Yale University's swimming team would win the NCAA championships year after year. In addition, I had no idea that the scene had been confirmed, yet it comes as no surprise to me at all. While their coach couldn't really swim, he was a great motivator for his swimmers. Isn't that what it's all about? I think it has to do with the concept of leadership. We're going to start today talking about congressional aides, that is, the people who work for our congressional representatives, both in Washington and in the representatives' local districts. It used to be that members of Congress had a relatively small staff of people working for them, and the role of these people wasn't of primary importance. But now there are thousands of congressional aides, and they've profoundly affected the way the whole government works. Congressional aides work in two different locations, one, in the congressional representatives' local offices, the districts from which they were elected, and two, in Washington. Staff in the local offices help members of Congress stay in touch with citizens in their districts. These citizens can bring problems in in person, or by mail or phone. This personal connection between the aides and the local people can be helpful when the next election comes around. People remember the help they get from the office of their local congressional representative. But as you know, members of Congress have to spend most of their time in Washington taking care of their legislative duties. Over 6,000 new laws are introduced in Congress each session. Without help, representatives would have trouble keeping up with the proposed laws that directly affect their districts. So that's why the congressional aides play a major role in Washington. They keep their bosses informed about pending legislation, organize hearings, and just keep their local congressional representatives up to date and informed on what's going on in other parts of Congress. Now another thing congressional aides do is to help develop ideas for laws that their bosses can eventually propose to Congress. This can be called the staff's entrepreneurial function, a bit like a business executive trying to find out what products are most popular. Congressional aides promote or encourage laws they think will be popular with the public. You've also got other employees that work for the whole Congress, not just for individual members. We'll talk about these people next. We're going to start today talking about congressional aides, that is, the people who work for our congressional representatives, both in Washington and in the representatives' local districts. It used to be that members of Congress had a relatively small staff of people working for them, and the role of these people wasn't of primary importance. But now there are thousands of congressional aides, and they've profoundly affected the way the whole government works. Congressional aides work in two different locations, one, in the congressional representatives' local offices, the districts from which they were elected, and two, in Washington. Staff in the local offices help members of Congress stay in touch with citizens in their districts. These citizens can bring problems in in person, or by mail or phone. This personal connection between the aides and the local people can be helpful when the next election comes around. People remember the help they get from the office of their local congressional representative. But as you know, members of Congress have to spend most of their time in Washington taking care of their legislative duties. Over 6,000 new laws are introduced in Congress each session. 
Without help, representatives would have trouble keeping up with the proposed laws that directly affect their districts. So that's why the congressional aides play a major role in Washington. They keep their bosses informed about pending legislation, organize hearings, and just keep their local congressional representatives up to date and informed on what's going on in other parts of Congress. Now another thing congressional aides do is to help develop ideas for laws that their bosses can eventually propose to Congress. This can be called the staff's entrepreneurial function, a bit like a business executive trying to find out what products are most popular. Congressional aides promote or encourage laws they think will be popular with the public. You've also got other employees that work for the whole Congress, not just for individual members. We'll talk about these people next. In terms of both both area and population, British Columbia is third among the provinces of Canada. Its northern boundary is 800 miles away from the United States, making it roughly 1.5 times the size of Texas. It encompasses the entirety of Canada's western coast, as well as the islands that lie immediately offshore. There are lengthy, craggy mountains spanning north and south over the majority of British Columbia. Even the islands off the coast are the skeletal remains of a mountain range that once stood here. Glaciers swept this region to near total submersion during the previous ice age. The summits of the mountain range are now spread across the shore. There is a humid mild marine climate in the southwest coastline area. Warm water flowing across the Pacific Ocean warms the westbound sea breezes that blow on shore. As a result, the winters are moderate and the summers are pleasant. They also bring moisture from the sea with them. The Rocky Mountains and the coastal ranges act as wind barriers inland, preventing the Pacific's prevailing winds from blowing over the plains. Cooled by the mountains, the winds begin to pour as they descend from the sky. Almost 200 inches of rain fall on the western slopes every year. Most of British Columbia is covered in dense forest. Douglas firs tower over the landscape on mountain slopes that receive a lot of rain. These enormous trees may reach heights of up to 300 feet and diameters of more than 10 feet. These trees are used to make more lumber than any other in North America. As well as these species, trees like hemlock and balsam fir may be found in the British Columbian wilderness. In terms of both both area and population, British Columbia is third among the provinces of Canada. Its northern boundary is 800 miles away from the United States, making it roughly 1.5 times the size of Texas. It encompasses the entirety of Canada's western coast, as well as the islands that lie immediately offshore. There are lengthy, craggy mountains spanning north and south over the majority of British Columbia. Even the islands off the coast are the skeletal remains of a mountain range that once stood here. Glaciers swept this region to near total submersion during the previous ice age. The summits of the mountain range are now spread across the shore. There is a humid mild marine climate in the southwest coastline area. Warm water flowing across the Pacific Ocean warms the westbound sea breezes that blow on shore. As a result, the winters are moderate and the summers are pleasant. They also bring moisture from the sea with them. The Rocky Mountains and the coastal ranges act as wind barriers inland, preventing the Pacific's prevailing winds from blowing over the plains. Cooled by the mountains, the winds begin to pour as they descend from the sky. Almost 200 inches of rain fall on the western slopes every year. Most of British Columbia is covered in dense forest. Douglas firs tower over the landscape on mountain slopes that receive a lot of rain. These enormous trees may reach heights of up to 300 feet and diameters of more than 10 feet. These trees are used to make more lumber than any other in North America. As well as these species, trees like hemlock and balsam fir may be found in the British Columbian wilderness. More than a century ago, Mostar was an Ottoman border town and then an Austro-Hungarian settlement, both of which spanned a deep valley of the Neretva River in Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
Many people associate Mostar with the historic bridge, Stari Most, and the old Turkish homes that line it. Many ancient buildings including the Sinar-designed old bridge were destroyed by violence in 1990s. As part of an international scientific committee set up by UNESCO, many of the historic buildings in the city's old town have been restored or reconstructed. Old Bridge, with its pre-Ottoman, Eastern Ottoman, Mediterranean and Western European architectural characteristics, is an excellent example of multicultural urban settlement. One of the symbols of reconciliation, international cooperation, and the coexistence of many ethnic and religious groups is the renovated Old Bridge and Old City of Mostar. More than a century ago, Mostar was an Ottoman border town and then an Austro-Hungarian settlement, both of which spanned a deep valley of the Neretva River in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Many people associate Mostar with the historic bridge, Stari Most, and the old Turkish homes that line it. Many ancient buildings including the Sinar-designed old bridge were destroyed by violence in 1990s. As part of an international scientific committee set up by UNESCO, many of the historic buildings in the city's old town have been restored or reconstructed. Old Bridge, with its pre-Ottoman, Eastern Ottoman, Mediterranean and Western European architectural characteristics, is an excellent example of multicultural urban settlement. One of the symbols of reconciliation, international cooperation, and the coexistence of many ethnic and religious groups is the renovated Old Bridge and Old City of Mostar. The coffee industry in Vietnam now employs millions of people, mostly on small farms like this one of a few acres. Across the country, farmers like Hoban produce a staggering million and a half tons of coffee, making it the country's most valuable export and the UK's number one source of coffee. Coffee is one of the world's most valuable traded goods, worth more than £40 billion globally, and it's the single most important tropical commodity. The coffee industry in Vietnam now employs millions of people, mostly on small farms like this one of a few acres. Across the country, farmers like Hoban produce a staggering million and a half tons of coffee, making it the country's most valuable export and the UK's number one source of coffee. Coffee is one of the world's most valuable traded goods, worth more than £40 billion globally, and it's the single most important tropical commodity. The big hurricanes last summer Harvey, Irma, and Maria knocked out internet service for many residents. But another threat to the internet is just plain old sea level rise. Ah, uh, yeah, some is already happening. Carol Barford, a biogeochemist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. There's a lot of data out there that shows that sea level on the coast is rising. And that, she says, means big problems for internet connectivity in major coastal cities like New York, Seattle, and Miami. Barford and her colleagues forecast that danger using a map of global internet networks and sea level rise data from NOAA. So there are two maps, where's the internet stuff and where's the flooding? 
and when they're superimposed, where they coincide, there are problems. Using NOAA's extreme sea level rise estimate, recommended for forecasts involving long-term infrastructure like this, the researchers say that 15 years from now, 4,100 miles of fiber optic cable could be underwater. And 1,100 internet hubs could be surrounded by water. And remember, our land-based infrastructure isn't waterproof like transoceanic cables are. Seawater comes in, and cabling is not meant to work underwater. So signals will be interrupted and dropped. The actual infrastructure itself might deteriorate. The researchers presented the peer-reviewed findings at the Applied Networking Research Workshop in Montreal this week. They also write that large internet service providers including AT, CenturyLink, and IntelliQuint face the greatest risk. If these predictions play out, internet companies need to harden their networks soon, they say. Or we could lose service during the emergency right when we need it most. The big hurricanes last summer Harvey, Irma, and Maria knocked out internet service for many residents. But another threat to the internet is just plain old sea level rise. Ah, yeah, some is already happening. Carol Barford, a biogeochemist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. There's a lot of data out there that shows that sea level on the coast is rising. And that, she says, means big problems for internet connectivity in major coastal cities like New York, Seattle, and Miami. Barford and her colleagues forecast that danger using a map of global internet networks and sea level rise data from NOAA. So there are two maps, where's the internet stuff and where's the flooding. And when they're superimposed, where they coincide, there are problems. Using NOAA's extreme sea level rise estimate, recommended for forecasts involving long-term infrastructure like this, the researchers say that 15 years from now, 4,100 miles of fiber optic cable could be underwater and 1,100 internet hubs could be surrounded by water. And remember, our land-based infrastructure isn't waterproof like transoceanic cables are. Seawater comes in, and cabling is not meant to work underwater. So signals will be interrupted and dropped. The actual infrastructure itself might deteriorate. The researchers presented the peer-reviewed findings at the Applied Networking Research Workshop in Montreal this week. They also write that large internet service providers including AT, CenturyLink, and IntelliQuint face the greatest risk. If these predictions play out, internet companies need to harden their networks soon, they say. Or we could lose service during the emergency right when we need it most. This is a bomb calorimeter. This is the actual piece of equipment that research reviews to calculate the energy content of either biodiesel or maybe even the potato chips that you had for lunch today. When they calculate the amount of energy they're going to calculate it in heat units which would either be joules or calories. I want you to look inside the bomb calorimeter. Inside here you can see that there's a silver bucket. Water goes all in here and this is actually the bomb is the smaller silver cylinder. What you do is put your fuel sample in there then. These two electrodes are connected to the bomb. These provide the spark that will ignite your sample when your sample burns or combusts that gives off energy. So how is the energy collected or how did how does a scientist figure out how much energy is being given off? Well, it's a closed system. There's a lid here that goes on top of this calorimeter and what's in here in the lid is a stir. The stir is going to stir the water that's in this big pool here so that the heat given off from the sample is going to warm the water in a uniform way. This is the temperature probe. This goes down in the water off so and measures the change in temperature because as the sample is burned it will give off heat and the temperature of the water will increase so the lid goes on the sample is prepared. The last thing that you need to make a combustion reaction happen is oxygen and at some point during the process some oxygen is added by a tank that's connected to the calorimeter here. So we are going to burn a sample of the biodiesel that you've prepared and get some feedback on the energy content of it. You'll be able to use this to compare it to petroleum-based fuels like octane.
This is a bomb calorimeter. This is the actual piece of equipment that research reviews to calculate the energy content of either biodiesel or maybe even the potato chips that you had for lunch today. When they calculate the amount of energy they're going to calculate it in heat units which would either be joules or calories. I want you to look inside the bomb calorimeter inside here you can see that there's a silver bucket, water goes all in here and this is actually the bomb is the smaller silver cylinder what you do is put your fuel sample in there then. These two electrodes are connected to the bomb these provide the spark that will ignite your sample when your sample burns or combust that gives off energy so how is the energy collected or how did how does a scientist figure out how much energy is being given off. Well it's a closed system there's a lid here that goes on top of this calorimeter and what's in here in the lid is a stir the stir is going to stir the water that's in this big pool here so that the heat given off from the sample is going to warm the water in a uniform way this is the temperature probe this goes down in the water off so and measures the change in temperature because as the sample is burned it will give off heat and the temperature of the water will increase so the lid goes on the sample is prepared the last thing that you need to make a combustion reaction happen is oxygen and at some point during the process some oxygen is added by a tank that's connected to the calorimeter here here, so we are going to burn a sample of the biodiesel that you've prepared and get some feedback on the energy content of it you'll be able to use this to compare it to petroleum based fuels like octane. Take a look at a vehicle, a house, or even a kite. All of these items have a structure or a frame, as you can see. The A-frame provides the thing form and strength. Similarly, our skeletal system is a framework that shapes and supports our bodies. The skeletal system's duties include providing structure and support, protecting internal organs such as the brain, heart, and lungs, and assisting in movement. Bones make form the skeletal system, or skeleton. There are 206 bones in an adult. The head, backbone, rib cage, and two pairs of limbs, which are linked to two pairs of girdles, make up the human skeleton. The skeletal system, like muscles, aids in the movement of our bodies. They are collectively known as the musculoskeletal system. The quantity, size, and form of bones in different areas of the body vary. Some bones are long, such as those in the arm and leg, while others, such as those in the wrist and ankle, are short. Some are flat, such as those in the skull, while the ear bone is irregularly shaped. Ligaments are flexible tissues that link bones. Bone marrow is a soft fatty substance that fills the long bones. The forehead and rear of your head are made up of two sets of bones that make up the skull. There are eight interconnected flat bones. Your face is made up of bones. The 14 bones that make up the face protect the eyes, nose, and tongue. The jaw is the biggest and most powerful bone in our body. The lower jaw, but not the upper jaw, can be moved. The movable lower jaw allows you to speak and eat. The sensitive brain is protected by the hard and bony skull. Take a look at a vehicle, a house, or even a kite. All of these items have a structure or a frame, as you can see. The A-frame provides the thing form and strength. Similarly, our skeletal system is a framework that shapes and supports our bodies. The skeletal system's duties include providing structure and support, protecting internal organs such as the brain, heart, and lungs, and assisting in movement. Bones make form the skeletal system, or skeleton. There are 206 bones in an adult. The head, backbone, rib cage, and two pairs of limbs, which are linked to two pairs of girdles, make up the human skeleton. The skeletal system, like muscles, aids in the movement of our bodies. They are collectively known as the musculoskeletal system. The quantity, size, and form of bones in different areas of the body vary. Some bones are long, such as those in the arm and leg, while others, such as those in the wrist and ankle, are short. Some are flat, such as those in the skull, while the ear bone is irregularly shaped. Ligaments are flexible tissues that link bones. Bone marrow is a soft fatty substance that fills the long bones. The forehead and rear of your head are made up of two sets of bones that make up the skull. There are eight interconnected flat bones. Your face is made up of bones. 
The 14 bones that make up the face protect the eyes, nose, and tongue. The jaw is the biggest and most powerful bone in our body. The lower jaw, but not the upper jaw, can be moved. The movable lower jaw allows you to speak and eat. The sensitive brain is protected by the hard and bony skull. There's sugar in a lot of foods where you don't expect it. Of course, there's tons of sugar in donuts of ice cream, or pastries, or other things that are sweet, candy of course, but there are other areas where you see it and you don't really anticipate it. So as an example, peanut butter. Here's a list of components from Skippy peanut butter and you notice that sugar is the second most prevalent ingredient. Therefore that you may know from the reading food labels that these elements in any food labels that are listed in order of how much there is in the item itself, so sugar comes straight after peanuts. Here's another example, beef stew. You wouldn't necessarily expect to find sugar in the beef stew yet it's there. Now it's down the list of ingredients, it's really toward the end, but if you look at the marketing of this and food at the can, it says, there's fresh potatoes and carrots, but actually there's more sugar in this than there are carrots. And so you wouldn't eat something like beef stew and expect to discover this to be the case. There's sugar in a lot of foods where you don't expect it. Of course, there's tons of sugar in donuts of ice cream, or pastries, or other things that are sweet, candy of course, but there are other areas where you see it and you don't really anticipate it. So as an example, peanut butter. Here's a list of components from Skippy peanut butter and you notice that sugar is the second most prevalent ingredient. Therefore that you may know from the reading food labels that these elements in any food labels that are listed in order of how much there is in the item itself, so sugar comes straight after peanuts. Here's another example, beef stew. You wouldn't necessarily expect to find sugar in the beef stew yet it's there. Now it's down the list of ingredients, it's really toward the end, but if you look at the marketing of this and food at the can, it says, there's fresh potatoes and carrots, but actually there's more sugar in this than there are carrots. And so you wouldn't eat something like beef stew and expect to discover this to be the case. <laughs> 